Hey everyone, welcome to Dave's Bonsai. On today's edition, Winter Wonderland. Hey everyone, welcome to Dave's Bonsai. Uh, in the sense that I have a branch that splits into two shoots in here, so I'm probably gonna cut this thing off right about here this fall. I've taken my uh, knob cutter and I've gotten rid of some of that. So I just put them on the bottom, growing upwards into the we bay. We up the trees and then we water as we need to. We try and get rid of those air pockets. Welcome everybody, it is February 20th, 2019, and by the time this video is edited, posted onto YouTube, and you have watched it, we probably have surpassed the uh, top snowiest February on record, possibly number one or two. We were at four a couple weeks ago, snow keeps falling. Shoveling's done, and I could do a ton of household chores, I could clean, I could organize, there's so much stuff I could do, even some work homework. Yeah. Instead, I'd rather be working on bonsai. So here I am doing something with bonsai. So a couple of, thing on, a couple of things on today's show. Uh, I want to talk about getting outside and checking your plants. So today was a snow day. I'm a teacher by day. I got the day off. It was glorious. Hopefully, I won't have to make it up. But I went outside. Good chance to check all my trees and see what's going on. Now, the snow is a wonderful thing for the uh, insulation of our trees. So they're winter hardy and they're sitting outside. And even though they can dry out with some wind and some sun in the winter, we'd like them to have a little bit of snow cover. So this snow has been awesome. It just all fell in February this year. So when you put your trees away uh, in next winter, something to think about now uh, is going out and checking where those trees are and what's happened throughout the winter. Don't just leave them out there all winter long. You've got to check them out. And the reason why I say that is because the more and more I check my trees, the more and more I found that critters were getting at them. I put some chicken wire on some of my trees and I put them inside my small cabin and so I'm going to show you that right now. Let's head outside and take a look at uh, where I keep some of my trees. So one good thing to keep in mind when you're talking about winter storage or uh, winter in the backyard, wherever your trees are being cared for by mother nature, you have to make sure that you're checking them on, checking on them once in a while. So again, this winter was so little snow that everything was exposed. I put a couple of trees uh, inside some chicken wire, so I had some uh, weeping willows that were kept nice in the uh, protection of some chicken wire. And then I have a birch cluster that's uh, been taken care of. And then I have two other trees, uh, but no one really touched those. So it seems every year that I've had trees out here, different species seems to be, seems to be attacked. Um, and you just never know what's gonna happen. Just inside my cabin, which are all trees that are not in a technical cold frame, but are enjoying the uh, semi-temperate temperature of protection. Keep these trees from the wind. And I believe I'm rodent proof in here. One of the reasons why it's nice to bury your trees in mulch and snow is this right here. This is an Amur maple that I got at a discount price of like 15 bucks. Had full leaves, or uh, branches rather, all the way up. As you can see, up to about there, the critters got them. And then they've left that alone because that was too tall. So, we have to be careful in our yards when we're keeping trees out, even though they're winter hardy, they're not pest hardy or critter hardy. And so there you can see all the eaten trees. So that uh, is an Amur maple. We'll see what happens to that later this year. I have a couple of blue forest junipers that I picked up on discount as well. Paid four bucks for these. There's two of them. And as you can see here, we got all kinds of critter damage. And all these were not in the snow earlier in the winter because we didn't have much snow. And now when you look outside on February the 20th, 2019, we have a boatload of snow. I always thought the junipers and pines were a little uh, more pest or rodent resistant or whatever's chewing on these guys. But as you can see, I got plenty of damage from just sitting outside as they weren't covered in the snow. So get outside and check your trees, whether it's in the cold frame or not, uh, throughout the winter. Uh, you know, we're coming up on March pretty quick here. And so we got that exciting spring season just around the corner. Um, but it's never too late to check, never too late to move your trees around and make sure you're checking to see if everything's okay. And so I moved a couple of these trees inside my little cabin here next year. I'll keep them in there permanently if I have the room. 
And uh, this little cabin out here might become a cold frame. I did insulate all the walls inside behind me and the ceiling. I have insulation. I'll try to get a heat source out here next year and, and give it a try for a secondary uh, cold frame. i uh, got some double pane windows uh, that are going to help keep some of that heat in there as well. So check your trees often. Don't let them go for long periods of time. And when they're under snow, that's a good thing. But they still might get those buds t uh, tipped off by some animals. So we're going to head inside and, and take a peek at a few other things for, for this show. It's always a good idea to check your trees throughout the winter months. Snow or no snow, we want to see what the critters are doing. And so out of my cabin, I had to put a couple of trees that were outside and, and recently put under a whole bunch of snow. Um, uh, but that didn't even help with some of the trees, so they were still uh, getting at them. So I have them in that small cabin. If you don't have that small cabin or a place to put them where you can cover them up, chicken wire helps with most of the critters, but certainly not mice. So if they were mice eating my trees, uh, that's where the indoor uh, cabin or storage unit of some capacity is going to help your trees. The nice thing about that cabin is they still get light through the windows that I have created in that cabin, so they're getting some light throughout the year. So I have two other trees indoors that I wanted to show you and talk about. So I brought in a couple of willows the last couple of weeks after their uh, at least eight weeks of dormancy. Uh, I like to get a little greenery in my green room and so I bring some in early. So I've been able to bring a couple of my uh, weeping willow trees in and these are all cuttings from only a year ago. And the nice thing about willow trees, now I'm not sure how the American changes or is different than the Japanese willow, uh, but they grow like a weed and you can propagate them very, very easily. So this spring coming up in a couple of months before the buds shoot out, if you go gotta cut a couple branches that are like the size of a pencil in thickness and uh, cut a couple of branches off, stick them into some loose soil and uh, keep them watered really well, uh, you're gonna have uh, many weeping willow trees. I love weeping willow trees and one of my goals in my bonsai uh, adventure is to get a couple of uh, uh, weeping willows that will be somehow around water in some kind of container that I will make. So I have a couple of uh, weeping willows here, that, uh, a couple of varying sizes that have been through a little bit of cuts and uh, damage from wind blowing it off my porch last year. But you can see inside my uh, room now, uh, all greenery in the last couple of weeks. So I got long leggy shoots. I'm going to be trimming some of these soon because they grow so fast it's recommended that you cut them back. Uh, per periodically uh, in, the, in the spring and summer when they're growing so you don't get these long, uh, uh, too long and leggy branches. Now of course weeping willows, we want them to weep eventually, but that's going to be later in the design of a weeping willow. We want to develop that strong base first and get that base bigger and thicker before we get those branches that are going to kind of come out and then naturally, naturally uh, weep down. And as these get bigger, they do have that natural weeping tendency. They will get bigger and heavier and kind of go down them on their own but it doesn't look proportional yet. So I'm just growing them out for thickness and all that kind of stuff. But one of my trees uh, got a little damaged. So I took a couple of photographs that I can cut to and show you this, but this guy here uh, was one of these trees. Okay, so before and after the critters. Okay, so I don't remember where I put this one, but apparently I didn't tuck it away like I thought. All my other weeping willows are behind that chicken wire that I showed you, or I can show you right now. But this guy was eaten to, to, yeah, to one inch of a trunk. But lo and behold, of course, I brought it in here just to, I wanted to see it continue. And, and um, a lot of people in bonsai, when they're just starting out, are afraid to make those big old chops of a tree. Now, I would have never cut this tree down this low, ever. I would have cut it down a little bit higher, <laughs> uh, less chopping. So, but look at that. You know, you can see it right there on camera a little bit. I have a close-up more with the photograph, but uh, I got two buds growing out of here, one from this branch over here and one from the main trunk right here. This can grow up and become the new trunk. We can trim and cut some of this uh, uh, gnawed part from the animal and make it look nice, and that'll heal over time, and who knows what it'll look like. So one of the reasons why I keep a tree like this and why I'm kind of excited is it's over a quarter inch thick already, this trunk, again from a cutting only a year ago. It's going to grow this nice branch hopefully right here and get a nice new main drunk, trunk for us, the apex there. And what's nice about a tree like this and what I really appreciate about bonsai, um, this is me personally, I'm not going by any books, any guidelines, any history of bonsai. What I love about some of the bonsai people I've met and, and some of the reasons why people are in it and some of their favorite trees, sometimes those favorite trees are not the traditional bonsai trees. They're something that had a lot of meaning to them. And so it was, uh, it was a tree that that person uh, and, and, uh, um, that they found on a, on, a, on a hike somewhere or it was in their backyard or I have a couple of um, red cedar or red uh, pines rather 
that are in my um, cabin that you maybe saw earlier that are from my stepfather's mom's place before they sold it last year. That house is no longer in the family after uh, several decades and I got two little sapling uh, uh, pine trees from her property before she sold the place and now that's going to grow into some uh, hopefully some bonsais and it'll have some history from it. I like that about bonsai and I like uh, kind of um, just taking some of these trees and you doing some unique trees and, and having a story. So I hope this story will be critter got to it let's see what can happen so uh, stay tuned uh, we'll show this uh, after this first summer of growth to show you what happens to it and then uh, maybe a few years down the road I'll have a great big uh, weeping willow tree that survived the test of time, including some critters. Now the other one that was demolished was another pine tree that I was surprised got demolished. So this was recently after I put a whole bunch of snow in front of it and placed it in for some insulation and all of a sudden I looked out there a couple of days later, maybe a week or so later, and checked on my trees from a distance and I went, that tree looks really weird and this is what it looks like right now. Okay, so we are in my garage. It won't be the cleanest video image for you. There's the tip of my Austrian pine, and it all looked about that thick and bulky all the way down the tree. And as you can see, there's nothing left to it. So I've got a big branch here, not off, not off, not off, right here, completely gone. Look up here, this uh, three branches that I would have been trimming this year. Here is a little bit of uh, some needles left. Gnawed off down here. So you can see there's still snow frozen on this. I had this outside, I put snow around it, and a couple of days later, everything was completely gnawed off. This might have been a deer. I don't know, do deer eat pine trees? I'm not up on that. But here we go. This was a $10 find at a nursery store, end of season, uh, in the discount section. That's a, what, about a five gallon pot? It's about a two foot tree with a trunk that's a solid inch round. And I don't know what it would have turned out if it's into a bonsai down the road. Ten bucks. So I'm not too worried about it, but I can't wait to see this one later. So here's the before, and we'll talk about it and show it hopefully in future episodes and see what I do with this Austrian pine. So you can imagine my shock when I went outside to check that tree, how destroyed it was. So. Trees can be destroyed in a number of ways, and I hope that that tree has a story that's really fun five or ten years from now, and I can say, hey, look, it's, it's still kicking, and uh, we'll show some progress over the years of the uh, Austrian pine. I don't know a lot about the Austrian pines. I do know that with my Scott pine and some of the pines that you do work on, you can't do a ton of things in one year. Um, so if I'm going to cut that thing up here before winter comes to spring, I'll cut a couple of the main branches I don't think I need off of that. And then I don't know if I'm going to put it in a bonsai pot this year because I think it's just going to be too stressed out. I'm going to have to leave it in its pot, I think, for one more full year in my backyard and just let it rejuvenate and see if it stays alive. Because we really shouldn't be working on our bonsai trees if they're that stressed out. It has to be, they have to be in good shape. They have to be grown, plentiful, and a lot of foliage, green, healthy, and then we can do some of our stuff. So that is going to limit me this year. I was excited maybe to put that into a, a, a pot. And actually the pot I, I had thought about for that tree, I think I still maybe will put it in there, but I'm not going to do much damage to the roots. I'm just going to stick it in there with some fresh dirt around there, loosen up the existing dirt a little bit. But it won't be bonsai soil yet. This will just be uh, more traditional soil like what, it, what it's in right now, so it'll just survive. And it is uh, more of a Japanese uh, pottery, piece of pottery that's kind of neat that'll go in my garden and it'll showcase the tree. It just is going to look a little scrappy this year. So there you have it, some trees that the critters have gotten to. I hope those, uh, you know, those junipers will probably grow fine. And I, I haven't even cut into those, you know, $4 trees from a nursery discount section. I hope to cut into those this uh, spring a little bit and just uh, change the shape a little bit and we'll make that work. Um, so my wrap up for today is just a kind of an update of my plant room. Um, if you've seen some of my earlier videos, my plant room has gone over a little bit of restoration. So one of the first things that I did was I put in a floor uh, in the last few months. I put in this uh, ceramic tile floor that I'm standing on. I've got a little close up for you I can cut to. And uh, so that's my first tile job. I've never tiled a floor before. So it's a great experience for me in my plant room. If I made a mistake, not too many people will see it. It's full of dirt and uh, bonsai soil and tree stuff. Uh, so it's kind of messy a lot anyway. <laughs> but it looks pretty nice. I think it turned out. In the back of my, uh, of my plant room, 
I have my new wall that was made from uh, repurposed uh, deck, my, my, my flashing on my deck underneath the floor, uh, the, the side of the deck. Uh, that was all pieces that I cut into three and four width sections and uh, put that up with um, uh, my back, for my back wall, uh, backdropping my fish tank with my, uh, my African cichlids. And then I put a couple of uh, shelves up there for some of my bonsai trees with uh, some leftover wood from the deck as well. So other than the new floor, everything in here was all recycled wood. And the recycled wood I used for my fence I built this year is down in the bottom section of my, of my uh, room. Added a little texture to the room, pretty cool. All my lights, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about my lights. I haven't talked about those in past videos. And these guys up here are not plugged in, the Unifuns. These are 45 watt uh, LED lights. When they're on, it makes everything a little more purple and pink, so that's why I don't have it on for video taping right now. But um, these have been up now for two full years of light. They say they have about 50,000 hours of light. I've used about 2,000 each season. Um, there have been some reviews about this Unifun light that uh, some of these bulbs go out pretty quickly. I have one roll of light that uh, is off of this uh, uh, unit on the right here as I'm talking, and then uh, the unit on the left, there's a couple of sparing bulbs that have burnt out. Nothing major yet, but they were about 25 bucks each. So for 25 bucks, two years of life, that's 12 and a half bucks a year. I'll probably get at least another year or two out of them. You know, six bucks a year for, for, for lights for my plants, not too much to ask for. So pretty much on the cheap. Everything in behind me and anything that's in a canister, I have canis the canister light that sh you know focuses that light on the plants. The ones up in the back up there, I got a close up of those as well. Um, those are just your uh, go to Home Depot Menards and get your grow lights. And those grow lights range from uh, 12 to 15 bucks per lamp. I have them up here, uh, actually in my room, in my, uh, my uh, ceiling lights. So I'm, I'm out of a light right here right now. I gotta get a new one, 15 bucks a crack. You know, I just don't go out and buy a ton of them, but all of these are grow lights. So um, one of the things I did want to mention is I've, I've adjusted a little bit with height. These are all about only six inches from my plants. And some people have said that their plants have burned even at 20 inches from their plants. I've seen no burning of my plants so far. They seem to like it. They're growing really, really well under these lights. Uh, things are looking pretty good. So the Unifun, uh, a pretty cheap and inexpensive way to get some LED lights with some of that full spectrum. You got the reds and the blues and the whites in there and get a lot of good uh, light for, for uh, flowering. I've had my Christmas cactus here flower a couple of times since I brought it in from the winter or from the fall I should say. And then I have my Japanese quince uh, that I brought back indoors here after its dormancy period and I like to bring it in so indoors and uh, see some of those uh, uh, buds. And I got two white flowers this year. This is a new tree to me. I've only had it for a couple of years, so I'm just hoping to keep this one alive. It's doing very, very well in the plant room. It's going to keep doing well. Um, one key thing to remember about if you're bringing trees in early, um, people caution you against bringing trees in too early because when you bring them outside in the sun after being in the plant room, you get that direct sunlight. You could burn out those leaves really quickly. So I will bring these outside and transition them slowly. Maybe bring them out, bring them back in for the first couple of nights. Uh, first week or so, and then uh, when it's the summertime or spring where it's going to stay outside, I should say, I'm going to keep them where there's more shade, more indirect sunlight at first, so they get used to just seeing all the rays of the sun from indirect light before they're sitting in full blazing sun and burning out the leaves. So that is the plant room. Uh, some new shelving, new floors, new backdrop, the fish tank still going, keeps it pretty uh, moist in here. Uh, the humidity is pretty decent throughout the winter months. I do also have that heater uh, down at the back corner there. I can show you that. That just goes off every couple of hours. It shoots off. So my average temperature in here is 68 degrees, but a couple of times throughout the day, it pops up there into the 70s. It gets as high as 78 degrees sometimes. Um, oh, and while I'm thinking about that, these Unifun lamps do not emit that much heat, so it's pretty nice too. So we don't really have a big worry of, again, uh, drying out or creating problems there. So they've been pretty decent lights for me. So there you have it, a quick update in a, a mid-winter or almost end of the winter fun day with February, breaking a record snowfall-wise, but I can always find something to do with my bonsais. So until next time, I'm Dave Weiss for Dave's Bonsai, and we'll catch you on the next one. Hey everyone, welcome to Dave's Bonsai. I in the sense that I have a branch that splits into two, shoots in here, so I'm probably gonna cut this thing off right about here this fall. I've taken my, uh, knob cutter and I've gotten rid of some of that. So I just put them on the bottom, growing upwards into the so we bay. We the trees and then we water as we need to. We'll try and get rid of those air pockets.